This morning, uh, we're going to be actually continuing a theme that we began looking at last week, and that is, of course, seeing that our Lord calls us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We need to know how it is we might be able to grow in that love. And what we're going to be looking at this morning is the fact that we cannot dilute it with love for other things. Again, we cannot serve to masters. We need to be devoted to the one. We need to be devoted to the Lord. Well, let's uh, read something about that in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. You know, it, it doesn't come any more powerfully than just simply reading the text. This is what John writes. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. May the Lord bless His Word to our hearing uh, this morning. Now again, uh, last week, we saw Jesus telling us that, um, that we are called to do certain things, certain things that God created us for, certain things He made us for, and the, uh, all of those things can really be summarized by just a couple of commandments, two. The greatest commandment and the second greatest commandment, that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. And the second one, that we love our neighbor as <clears throat> we love ourselves. Uh, basically, everything that God wants us to do is summarized by love, that we would give our whole being to loving Him. If we do, everything will basically come out as it ought to come out. Now, there's many reasons, of course, why the Lord calls us to do this. First of all, because it is the right thing to do. I mean, I think even unconverted people would say that it's right to love and not to hate, although they wouldn't always say that. Sometimes I think it's right to take vengeance on people or to get even. But the Lord tells us it is always right to love. And I think having our eyes opened by the Holy Spirit, we understand that. And we know that that's good and that's true. And that's why the Lord commands us to do this, because He does know that it is right. But let's not forget as well what Jesus said last time with regard to these commandments, that this is what must be fulfilled in us before we will be able to enter into heaven. Now, again, I realize that that raises flags, of course, but Jesus did say, do this and you will live. Now, again, we know that we can't do that. We have all failed. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But since we have failed, God sent His Son into the world to do this for us. That's really what the gospel is all about. That if you turn from your sins from not loving God and not loving your neighbor, and you begin to do what the Lord calls you to do, and of course, trust Jesus Christ, because that's the only way you'll ever be able to do these things, the Lord will take away all of your failures, all your failings, all of your imperfections, all your sin, and He will give you His perfect righteousness, which is basically a record of perfect obedience. He will save you from what your sins deserve, which is hell. He will save you from hell. And He will give you what you don't deserve. He will give you heaven. So that's why the gospel is called good news, right? Because what we could not do, God has done for us in His Son, and He offers it to us as a free gift. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to pay for it. All we need to do is receive it by faith, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you do that, you will turn from your sins at the same time. We turn from our sins to Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus Christ obeyed, um, we might say, in order to save us from 
our sins. But we do need to understand that the Lord never intended through this work of the Lord Jesus Christ to eliminate the standard or to do away with these commandments. Jesus didn't obey for us so that we would not have to obey. And again, I, I repeatedly say that because I know there are many churches today that, that teach it as, as explicitly as this, that you don't have to obey God. Jesus obeyed for you so you can live the way you want to and still go to heaven. They, they say it. They say it as bluntly, as plainly, as blatantly as that. And that is going to condemn people because that is not why Jesus Christ came into the world. The Bible says if you trust in Jesus Christ, your life will be changed. If your life isn't changed, you're not trusting in Jesus, so you're not saved. And if you tell people you can live that way, they're going to think they're saved when they're not really saved and they're going to end up going to hell because somebody told them they could do that, okay? No, that's not why the Lord came into the world. Jesus didn't obey for us so that we would not have to obey. He actually came into the world in order to uh, not only purify us from our sins, but to give us the ability to obey that we didn't have before, to give us a love for the good and right way. He still wants us to love God. That's why He came into the world, was so that we could love Him with our whole being. And He still wants us to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's what the Great Commission is all about, go out and make disciples of all the nations. Bring them into the kingdom of God that they might be saved from destruction and brought safely to heaven. Jesus obeyed so that we could obey as well. He doesn't destroy the standard through His work. He actually gives us the ability to keep the commandments through His work, not perfectly, but at least to grow in that direction. He's given us His Holy Spirit to work His character in us so that little by little, although we like it to be lot by lot, but it turns out to be little by little, we are being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. We are becoming more like Him, not in physical appearance, of course, but in the way we live, that we are reflecting His character. That's really what the Christian life is all about, becoming more like Jesus, not just salvation from hell. It's about transformation into His image. And again, the Lord has not left us <coughs> without incentives. He doesn't call us to do this for nothing. God has loved us with an infinite love. I mean, look at what He's given to us. This evening, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 12, and Paul is going to exhort the Romans by the mercies of God to offer themselves up as a living sacrifice. This evening, we're going to look a little bit at those mercies, but I, I hope you remember enough of them to be motivated by this. God has loved you with an infinite love. He has sent His Son to live for you and to die for you, to prepare a heaven for you and to prepare you for heaven. The Lord has, has put His love in your heart so that you can love Him in return. These are powerful incentives, the love God has for us and the love that we have for God. You know that as you obey the Lord, as you see that love in your life for Him and as you sense His love, it strengthens your assurance, which is also a tremendous blessing and incentive to go this direction because the more we see His grace at work in our lives, the more assured we are that we are actually His people. That's something that Christians often struggle with. Am I really a Christian or am I not a Christian? Am I on my way to heaven or am I still on my way to hell? Well, if we would just love the world less and put our sins to death and use the means God has given us to be filled with His Holy Spirit, we would be more assured that we are the Lord's. And, of course, God has promised rewards as an incentive uh, to love Him and to love others. Each time we do this, each time we deny ourselves to do His will, every time we love Him and our neighbor as ourselves, God is giving us a reward in heaven that we will get to keep forever. And I know that oftentimes in Scripture it's represented as, as you know, gold and silver and precious stones, but it, it's, those are really symbolic. It's something much more precious than that because what good is gold going to do you in heaven? What good is gold going to be in the new heavens and the new earth? 
Whatever these rewards are, they are much greater than just simply material things that we think of as precious in this world. They are things that will be precious in heaven. But there is at least one more incentive that God gives to us that we don't often think about with regard to why we should love in this way. One that I think is very important to us, of course, while we are here on earth. And it's this. The more that we love in this way, the more that we give our hearts to the Lord, the more that we love others, the more we reflect the image of Jesus Christ, the more God will be for us. You know, um, in Scripture, there, there are certain things that sometimes we have a hard time grasping. Sometimes God seems to single out particular individuals and He says, this one has a heart after my own heart. This one is a friend of mine. This one walked with God. This one God loves so much that He took him immediately to be with Him in heaven. Does God have favorites? Is that what the Bible is saying? Well, as a matter of fact, that is what the Bible is saying. Can God love one of His children more than another? As a matter of fact, it appears as though God does. There there are those that God favors. But what is it that makes Him favor them. Well, it's the kind of heart that they have. It's how much they love Him. Now, God does set His affection on all of His children the same. He has given to us the same Spirit. He has given to us the same righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. What could be better than that? He's taken away all of our sins. But there is a component, as it were, in this whole whole, um, working out of our salvation that has to do with us. And that's called sanctification. That's our growth into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. And sanctification is not something that God does by Himself. It's something that we are to work together with Him on. We are His workmanship, but we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling in the sense that if we are to grow in grace, if we are to grow into the image of Christ, we have to put effort into it. And the more effort we put into it, The more we become like Jesus Christ, the more the Lord is going to favor us and be with us and help us in the things that we set out to do. The prophet Hanani said to Asa, the king of Judah, in 2 Chronicles 16.9, which is what our memory verse is, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that He may strongly support those whose heart is completely His. Does that passage mean anything? Well, yes, because God doesn't speak idly, does He? He's telling us that He is looking, and He is looking for a particular kind of individual, and that that individual be the kind whose heart is completely His. And when He finds such an individual, He strongly supports him in what He is doing. It also implies that He's going to find people whose hearts aren't completely His, And He's not going to support them as strongly. And the question then this poses to us this morning is simply this. Do you want His help? Do you want His support? As you seek to serve the Lord in this world, do you want to be the kind of person that God is going to favor and get behind? Well, if that's what you want, then you need to develop the kind of heart that God can support, a heart that is completely His, a heart that loves Him in the way that Jesus told us that we must love Him, and a heart that loves your neighbor as you love yourselves. In other words, a heart after His own heart, or what we'll call here <clears throat> a heart for God. Now, what, what I'd like to do is over the next few Lord's Day develop this theme a little bit beginning with a consideration of what is perhaps our greatest obstacle. There are many obstacles, actually three, that stand in our way. There is Satan, and there is the flesh, but there is also the world. And we're going to begin with a consideration of the world. And the point I want to make is simply this. If you want a heart for God, you have to overcome any love that you have for this world. Of course, we're going to have to explain a little bit what that means, 
but that's what John does in our text. So this morning, let's see three things from this passage. First of all, what the Lord tells us we are not to love, do not love the world. On the other hand, what it is we are to love, because for everything we are not to love, there, of course, is that which we are to love, and we're going to see that they are opposites. And what difference does it make, okay, whether we do it, whether we do what He calls us to do or not? So first of all, what does the Lord tell us not to love? Well, that is quite simple. In verse 15, John writes, do not love the world nor the things in the world. Now, again, it sounds simple, but what does he mean? Is John simply pointing out the really bad things in the world that we should avoid, things that make, make us recoil when we hear about them, you know, gross immoralities, and there's plenty of those around. Uh, again, the destruction of families, uh, murder, theft, rape, all these things that we hear about. Well, certainly God means those things. We shouldn't, we shouldn't love that. That's evil. But that's not all that He has in mind, and that's something that we need to think about for a moment. The Lord, when He says, do not love the world, is basically talking about everything that is in this world that is displeasing to Him, everything that He hates, everything that is on the opposite side of the moral spectrum from what it is that He loves from what he knows is right and good. Now, there's a lot that is in this world that is like this, perhaps much more than we would care to admit. How do we come to grips with what these things really are? Well, John actually helps us. He boils it down to three categories, which we're not going to be able to explore extensively, but we certainly do want to try to understand what it means. There's three, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. These are the things, he says, that are in the world, things which we are not to love. And he implies here, of course, that we are, on the other hand, to hate them. So what is the lust of the flesh? Well, that's something that we actually are very intimately acquainted with because it's something that goes on in our hearts all the time that we're supposed to be resisting and fighting against so that we don't give in to it. The evil desires in our hearts. There are many things in the world that appeal to those fleshly appetites that are in us. Things that are wrong that we should not go after. Those are the things, of course, that God tells us are wrong. Or even things that are good that, that we might be tempted to go after, but for the wrong reasons. You know, we, um, we, we've seen in Pilgrim's Progress, and we've talked about it on numerous occasions, that there are things in the world that may not necessarily be bad things, but our reason for wanting them could be wrong. We can want even good things for a fleshly or wrong reason. Just think about buy-ins. He wanted to be a Christian but only when it suited him. In other words, he wanted something that may be good, but he wanted it for the wrong reasons, when it's popular or when he can profit by it. Um, that's the wrong reason. So again, even good things can be desired for the wrong reasons. The lust of the flesh, things that appeal to the fleshly appetites. And what I mean by fleshly is not our body. It's not that I can't have an apple or... I can't have a piece of food or something like that, but it's talking about sinful appetites. And again, that's very broad, isn't it? Very broad. You have to look at the Bible. You have to read the Bible. We're going to see this evening. You have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can see what these things are. The Spirit of God will bear witness to the truth when it's in your mind, but you need to get it in your mind and you need to have the will to apply it. Well, the lust of the flesh is one thing in the world. There is also those things that we know are, we're also liable to, and advertisers <clears throat> know very well that this is how they're going to get us to pay attention to what it is they're trying to sell us. It's called the lust of the eyes, the things that we look at. We have to realize that temptation usually comes to us through our eyes. That's the, perhaps the most common way that it does. We see something that we want, 
and we begin to desire it. We need to avoid that, John says. And again, I would just refer you to all the advertising that's going on in the world. I mean, how is it that people advertise the things they want to sell? They put something in the picture that will draw your attention, and once your attention is drawn, then maybe you'll see the product they're also trying to draw your attention to. Anyway, we need to be aware of that. The lust of the eyes, there are so many things to charm us, as we just read. And then, of course, the boastful pride of life that has to do with a particular desire to be noteworthy in this world, to have fame and to have glory and to have recognition, to be outstanding. I mean, what is it that, that parents are often encouraging their children to do in non-Christian families and even in Christian families? Become a doctor, become a lawyer, become a president, you know, do something noteworthy, stand out, become someone great. Well, that's actually what John is telling us is of the world and something we shouldn't be striving after, at least if we're doing it just for ourselves, you see. There's a great deal of overlap in these categories, but they all have to do with one thing, and that is the flesh, <clears throat> the carnal appetites, the evil desires that we have in our hearts that sin creates. You know, what John gives us here is a perfect description of the world and what it is that is moving the world to do what it, what it does. You know, Jonathan Edwards um, uh, says in his book, Religious Affections, that affections are what drive people to do the things that they do. We do things because we want to do them. He said, take away all the affections of the world and the world would, would come to a standstill. Everybody would be standing there and doing nothing because they had no desire to do anything. We need the fuel of the affections to move us to do something. Well, what is it that moves the world to do what it does? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. That is their fuel. That is what's moving them. That is what is behind everything they do, that they might have these things, that they see and desire, that they might have this glory that comes from the world. By the way, that is the reason why you must never use the world as an example of what it is that you should be and what you should be seeking after because they're doing everything wrong. Now, they may do some things outwardly good, but they will always be doing them for the wrong reasons. So never use their motivation and avoid what they do that is contrary to the will of God. Again, what they do, they do purely out of sin. Another way of putting this is that they do it completely uh, for themselves. Uh, another word we can substitute for sin is selfishness, self-centeredness. The desire to gratify their own appetites, their own lusts, their own desires, their own uh, you know, is desire for glory purely for themselves. Now, let's remember why God made us in the first place. He made us that we might serve Him. They want to serve themselves. God made us to glorify Him. They want to glorify themselves. By the way, this is why the Bible says God is at war with them. He is at war with the world and the world is at war with God. When we come to Jesus Christ, He says the war is ended. We have peace with God. We didn't have peace before because we were fighting with Him because we want what we want, and He wants what He wants, and what He wants is right. So the point here is that if you want to have a heart for God, you can't have that kind of a heart. You can't love the world because God hates those things. He loves those who love Him. But what does He think about those who hate Him? Well, God is angry with the wicked every day, the Bible says. You do not want a heart that is full of the world. You must hate the world and not love the world. Now, that brings us to the second point. If, if these are the things we are to avoid, what are the things that we should be uh, developing in our hearts so that we might have a heart for God? Well, you need to put away the things that God hates. On the other hand, you need to begin to love what He loves. Now. The things that, that God desires are, are different. They're the opposite of what is in the world. 
So instead of the lust of the flesh, what do you suppose would be pleasing to God to have within your hearts? But the Spirit of God. God hates flesh. He hates the sin that is in our hearts and that is in the hearts of ungodly men. But He loves the things of the Spirit. He loves what the Spirit of God does in our hearts. He loves the desires the Spirit of God produces in our hearts because the desires He produces are holy desires for things that are good. That's the reason why He gave you His Spirit in the first place and why you need the Spirit of God, why you need to be uh, born again before you can see the kingdom of heaven and enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's why, as we read in Ephesians chapter 2, that God has to quicken us to life in His mercy before we can move Godward. He gives us His Spirit to break the power of the flesh so that we may move in the right direction, that we may move toward the things of heaven. So if you are to have a heart for God, you have to have the Spirit of God in your heart. You have to yield to the Spirit of God and not to the flesh. Remember what Paul writes in Galatians 5.16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. How are you going to overcome the sin that's inside of you? You can only do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. So instead of being moved by your fleshly appetites, be moved by the Spirit of God. Agree with Him. Let Him lead you. Submit to Him and yield to Him as He seeks to lead you in the ways of the Lord. And He does that, of course, through the Word of God. I'm not saying just follow your impulses. That's not what we're talking about. But we're talking about follow the Spirit of God as He leads you in the Word that He Himself inspired, the Word of God. This is the only thing we can trust. We can't trust our, our experiences, okay? We need to make sure that we're focused here. Now, secondly, instead of having eyes that are focused on the things of the world, seeing them and desiring these things for ourselves, the Lord wants you to fix your eyes on the things that can't be seen with your physical eyes, and He wants you to desire them. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 17 through 18, For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Notice, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal or temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Uh, the Lord would basically have us look through the eyes of faith to the realities of the unseen world, the one that exists now, the kingdom of heaven, and that world which is coming. And He would have us desire that rather than the world that we see because the world we see is temporary in two ways. Whatever you gain in this world, you are going to have to give up. You know, you're going to leave this world. But secondly, this world is going to burn up someday. Uh, even if you could hold on to it, you'd have to let go of it. The things that you can't see, though, the things that God has created that are spiritual in nature, uh, the things that He has promised that haven't yet come, those are the things that are actually going to last forever. Uh, the Lord wants us to do what Abraham did. He, God told Abraham, I want you to leave Ur of the Chaldees. I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave everything you have. And I want you to go to a, to a place that, that you've never seen before. And Abraham believed God. He left Ur of the Chaldees. He went out looking for the city that God has built for those who love Him and for those who desire better things. The Lord wants you to get your eyes off the world and He wants you to put them on the things of the world that is coming, on the things above, on spiritual things. And then finally, instead of the boastful pride of life, instead of trying to gain all the glory you can for yourself in this world, He wants you to instead to humble yourself and seek the Lord and serve Him and seek really to bring glory to Him rather than to yourself. That's what servants do. They glorify the master. People who are their own masters glorify themselves. God wants us to humble ourselves and be servants and seek to bring glory to Him. Remember when the disciples were haggling with one another over who was going to be greatest among them in the kingdom of heaven? They wanted the place of greatest authority. 
Jesus called them to himself and he corrected them. He said this, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. So instead of seeking to bring attention to yourself, get glory and fame for yourself, if you are to have a heart for God, you need to seek to make His name great. This is the kind of heart that God desires, the kind of heart that God loves, the kind of person He can support. You need to seek Him and His glory and not the things of the world. Now, I've already given you essentially uh, what, what difference it makes. I mean, that, that's basically the last point, isn't it? What difference does it make whether we love the world or we love God? I, I think for a number of Christians, they think it makes no difference. Jesus saved me. I'm cleansed. I've got His righteousness. I'm on my way to heaven. doesn't matter if I dabble or compromise or, or do this or that. Well, it really does make a big difference. I mean, John tells us if we're not careful and we love the world in the way that he is saying that we should not love it. He says it makes all the difference between heaven and hell. That, that's how big of a difference it makes. He says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What that means is he doesn't have the Holy Spirit because that's what the love of God is. He is the Spirit of God who produces love in our hearts. He says, if you love the world, you don't have the Spirit of God in your soul working in a saving way. So basically what he's saying is this, that if after everything you've heard this morning, you still love the world, the things God hates and tells you not to love, and you want it rather than God, then you really don't love the Father. The love of the Father, as I said, is, is His love within us that enables us to love Him. The love of the Father is not in you. Now, why does John say this? Again, it's because all that God loves and desires is the opposite of the world. And we cannot have both. There has to be an ascending principle in our hearts. One has to be greater than the other that gives us a devotion for one. That's the way that it is. If you're a Christian... You have a love for God that gives you a devotion for God so that you won't love the things of the world. If you're not a Christian, you don't have a love for God, so you have just a love for the world, and the love that you think you have for God is not the kind of love that you need. That's something only God can give. Now, I do want to make sure we understand that this doesn't mean that if you're being tempted by the world and have a desire for the things of the world that you don't love the Father at all, because we've already seen that the Christian's life is one of warfare between two opposing principles, the flesh and the spirit. And, and it's the flesh that's in you, that remaining corruption, that still gives you a desire for the things that God tells you you shouldn't love. But you also have the Spirit of God in you that is giving you a greater love for Him that does not allow you to love the world in the way He tells us not to love. If we have God's love in us, we will resist the world to the point that we will not go after it the way that John is warning us here not to. But if, on the other hand, we're continually pursuing after the world uh, as opposed to God, we want the world, we, we, we want to fulfill those desires of the flesh, we want what we see, and we want that position and notoriety. If that is, really describes your life, then you have every reason to suspect that the love of the Father is not in you. Because how can you say or even believe that you love God when you love the things that He hates and continually devote yourselves to those things? You can't serve two masters. You have to serve one or the other. Jesus said to His disciples in John 14, 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them 
is the one who loves me. So again, the question is, are you going to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbor as yourself? That's what Jesus commands you to do. If you keep those commandments, then you can know that you love Him, that that love of God, the love of the Father really is in your heart. But if you really love the things of the world instead, and those are the things that you are going after, you're breaking His commandments, and you're not loving Him. The love of the Father is not in you. Now, if you are in love with the world this morning, the Lord tells you that you need to give it up, or you will perish with the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. You must turn from those sins and trust in Jesus Christ. You need to ask Him to break that power that sin has in your life and give you a new heart because only God can do that, as we read in Ephesians 2. As we know from John 3, what Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, and only God can bring about the new birth. Only God in His mercy, when you're dead in trespasses and sins, can make you alive. Ask Him to give you a new heart. Now, if you have this kind of heart, it's only if you have this kind of heart that you can really love God enough to forsake the world and obey Him. And it's only if you're doing that that you can know that you have eternal life. Verse 17, the one who does the will of God lives forever. Jesus says, the one who loves me is the one who keeps my commandments. When you are doing that, then you can know God has given you His love. He has given you His Spirit. He has caused you to be born again. He has united His, His Spirit to your soul and made you alive again. So again, if you love the world, this is what you must do. Now again, we as Christians who do love the Lord still struggle. And if you do have a heart that loves the Lord and seeks to do His will, what does this text say to you? Well, again, this is the whole point of the thing. If you want to be a man, a woman, or a child after God's own heart, one that God will strongly support, then you need to do these things. Put your sinful desires to death by the Spirit of God and seek to be filled with the Spirit. It's only those who are filled with the Spirit that will be able to love God with the kind of love that He will strongly support. Secondly, get your eyes off the things of the world. Stop looking at the world. Stop desiring the world. And instead, get your eyes on the things that can't be seen that God has promised, the things that God says are real, on the kingdom of heaven, on the glory that comes from Him, on the future life, on heaven when you should leave this world, on the new heavens and the new earth. Fix your eyes on the invisible things and get them off of this world which is going to perish. And then finally, give up your aspirations of being somebody great in the world. Boy, this is the, this is the hardest one, isn't it? Because we all come into the world and, you know, not only coming into the world, but we've all been encouraged to do this be someone great, be outstanding, you know, grab for all the guests or whatever, get, get the highest honors and accolades that you can because that will reflect on, you know, if you're a parent, that will reflect on me. I raised this kid, you know, kind of thing. But no, that's the opposite of what the Lord wants us to be. You have to give up your aspirations of gaining glory for yourself. That's selfish, that's sinful. God did not put us into the world to, to grab glory for ourselves. He put us into the world to bring glory to Him. And so we need to humble ourselves and become servants, His servants, to seek to bring glory to Him, attention to Him, to honor Him. Now, if you will do these things, if you will be filled with the Spirit, set your eyes on the things that are invisible, and if you will humble yourself and become a servant, that will honor God. God will be pleased with you. You will be a man, woman, or child after God's own heart, and God will support you in the things that you seek to do for Him in the world. He's not going to help you do the things that He hates. That's never going to happen. We can't ever expect God to support us in that way. 
But if you have a heart for God and are seeking to do what honors Him, and He sees that, He will be with you and He will support you as you seek to glorify Him. When you are for God, then you can know that God is for you. So may the Lord grant that each one of us might seek to do what it is that He calls us to do, that we would listen to this warning and get these things out of our hearts and that we would replace them and with those things we know that God loves and that we would nurture those things and grow into the image of Christ and be those kinds of people that God calls His friends. Well, let's, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would help us to do this.